You are listening to What It's Like with Luz, a podcast highlighting ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Lucy Norris, and on today's episode, I'm sitting down with television presenter, creator, and voice of the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. Reminiscing on the fact that her earliest ambitions were to become a dancer, this week's guest has always had an interest in the world of entertainment. Getting a taste of the industry through appearances in various music videos and dance gigs as a child, she stumbled upon presenting as a way to make ends meet and fell in love. Finding her break through voicing the 2012 Olympic ceremony, her interest in sports presenting grew and with the exposure came new, very well-deserved opportunities in that area. Chatting to me about the highs and lows of her career journey, her experiences with sexism in a male-dominated industry, and her recipe for success. Here's what it's like to be Layla and Ali. Welcome, Layla. Thank you so much for coming on and joining me today. How I would love to Thanks kick off, and no worries at all, how I would love to kick off the conversation is to just chat a bit about you know, the very beginning and from when you were younger, where your initial interest in the world of media and presenting came from? Oh, deep question. Go way back because it feels like quite a long time ago. <laughs> um, I was always a little bit of a performer at home. Um, I always had a lot of um, energy and my mum actually put me in dance classes young because she was just like, I'd come home from school and still have loads of energy and she couldn't cope. And she was like, you need to move your body and go to classes and use this energy up. So she put me in ballet very young and hip hop and loads of different dance classes. And, and I, I loved them. Um, and eventually I started doing like summer schools and summer camps at theatre school and I absolutely loved them as well. And, and actually the majority of my youth, I always was gonna be a dancer. I wanted to be a dancer. Um, I also always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit like I well my mom always says that um, she loved my first business plan when I was five is that I wanted to open a shoe shop for centipedes because I thought there was a gap in the market and how many shoes they buy every time you know by my calculations that was a good business idea (laughs) I love Um, that (laughs) yeah and she was like, you know, you're not wrong. And, and then I kept coming up with these little ideas and trying to make money in different ways. And I'd always sell stuff at school. I'd be the one that had like, I'd buy these bulk buy penny sweets and then pa- repackage them in smaller packets and sell them for more than I bought them for. And so I always ha- kind of had this um, sort of a drive to make money and a drive to sort of run little businesses and have little ideas. And I was always very creative and um I'm kind of having it was it was an independent spirit as well in that I wanted to have my own money do my own thing and it was very sort of self-possessive feeling that I always had um and I think as I get older and I see the industry more I, I see that so clearly when I'm working in industries that are so male dominated so obviously now I work in um MMA and football which is two of the most male dominated industries in the world and I still see that I very much want to prove myself to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm a very, uh, I, a, a disruptive character in that I want to go the hard route, if that makes sense. And I love to have a challenge and prove myself in difficult situations. And so my upbringing was like that too. My mom would always say like, why are you choosing the hardest route? There's all this stuff that comes to you. And all of a sudden you're always choosing the hardest route. And so yeah, I grew up wanting to be a dancer and presenting kind of came to me later on so dancing I did um I did sort of semi well I did do some professional work dancing I used to do sort of like uh, kids tv opening shots do you remember things like like you won't remember I think you're a lot younger than me but there was like um Saturday morning tv shows and dig it and and stuff like that Cat Dealey and Anna and Deck and they used to have yeah. an opening sequence where kids would dance and so I was in lots of these different dance troupes um and did like music videos for people like Billy Piper when she did her music video and and um, so, yeah, I did a little bit of dancing and sort of got into that, but realized not only was it a highly competitive industry, but physically very demanding. Um, and when I was quite young, I moved out of home and had to fend for my own way. And I got a couple of little presenting jobs and realized like, holy, this is good money. Like it's silly money and it still is right. Compared to the rest of the world, but yeah. I don't know how 
but paying someone to speak is just ludicrously overvalued. I'm not going <laughs> to complain. Um, but we get paid very, very well. And I saw that and the, the sort of cha-ching signs appeared and I thought, holy, I can't miss out on this opportunity. It's a very good value for, you know, I work to live. I, I love, um, I'm very much a girl who loves to have fun and make my work has to be my joy. And, um, if you can get paid really well for it, you know, I'm no fool. I'll take the money and run. So I walked towards presenting mostly because of the money at first. And then as I started doing it, I realized how much I enjoyed it and how much I could sort of combine my creativity with it. And then you add the fact that it was the perfect era. You know, YouTube started to launch, sort of user generated content started to launch. And for me, who wanted to make my own thing, never loved the idea of working for other people and, and wanted to be a presenter, like everything just combined at the perfect time for me. Wow, that's such an incredible story, though. I love the bits about um, the entrepreneurialism at the start, because I think that's uh, kind of a surprising aspect to your story in terms of getting to where you are today. Um, and so you mentioned, you know, you were you were fending for yourself, you were getting yourself little jobs here and there. But what was your, I suppose we'll call it a breakthrough moment into the industry where you were feeling that you were kind of set in this and you really could drop everything to make this your full-time career? So I kind of had two moments. Main one, without a doubt, was the London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. Mm. Um, Danny Boyle chose me to be the narrator of the, of the entire mm. ceremony. So like the voice of the Olympic opening ceremony. And me alongside male voice in French and English, we hosted that. And he wanted, he didn't want a voiceover artist. He wanted a storyteller. And he also wanted a voice that you couldn't quite pinpoint where they're from. You know, they, he wanted that clarity, but it, he wanted it to be worldwide. And he wanted everyone to feel included. And, and my accent, my voice, my, it's all a bit strange. And it's all a bit mixed. <laughs> people can't quite pinpoint where I'm from and so it was perfect for him um, and when I did the opening ceremony was when I first realized like okay now people are coming to me you know like now this is big until then and, and still you know we always grind we always push for the next job and we always pitch but until then I was working really hard to get jobs and quite literally from the next day it was phone call, phone call, phone call to me. So it, it did have a massive shift was the London 2012 Olympic Games. But I was full time for quite a while before that as well. I, I was very lucky in that, you know, I'd always go to auditions. I kind of included little bits of modeling, little bits of other stuff in between to try and make sure I wasn't working in normal jobs. Just because any normal job I did in between to pay my way would, um, would mean I couldn't go to a last minute auditions. So like I had, um, I worked in, Selfridges selling perfume and makeup for a little while and and I got sacked from that within two months because I kept having to take random days off because I had an audition to go to and and then I moved to Harrods and and then I started working in coffee shops and literally I got sacked every time because as soon as you get a job someone calls you and says oh do you want to audition for Blue Peter I'm like yes now I'm there yeah. you know so I just had to keep letting people down and so um, I was I was lucky enough to sort of have a few of those little bits but quite quickly pull together enough presenting jobs to live a sort of very simple life and um and the London 2012 Olympic Games really was a big shift for me yeah I think that must have been such an incredible experience as well just being so involved in um the whole process of the Olympics because it's such an iconic event um and so do you feel like that was where your interest in say the sporting area of presenting came about or had you, did you always have that did you always envision yourself moving over into that sector and working so heavily there so yes and no because um the olympic games cemented it for me like i was always messing around in sports anyway because i loved it right but i never thought that would be the presenting route i'd go to and initially um, the presenting, I used to do live poker games on like late night poker television and stuff like that. And those sort of channels paid well. And the sports stuff didn't. And the sports stuff I did as a hobby and for fun. I used to do um, BMX and cycling and I had lots of friends in mountain biking. So I used to do stuff for the Extreme Sports Channel, stuff for Eurosport before the 2012 Olympic Games. But that stuff I did was more my joy, more my hobby. And I didn't see that as the path until the Olympic Games. And then I realized, oh, hang on a minute. Sport can make me the money that I want, especially if I go into the sport that I love the most, 
which being Brazilian is you know, football, you know, and, and yeah. I never, yeah, and I was, I never really put two and two together. I think also because there aren't that many women or there weren't at my time women that I could look up to and go, oh, I want to do what she does. You know, that the space wasn't filled with women that could give me that idea in the first place. But also I, I kind of just always saw the sport world as the fun bit, you know, oh, that's for fun. That's not really hard work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then as soon as I did the Olympic Games, I realized, okay, this is actually, I could work in sport. And, and as people were coming to me and I started to realize I could do a good job of it as well. That's the other thing is that sometimes you want to work in something, but you're not the best at it. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas um, when it came to poker television, I knew I was damn good at that. And when it came to football, I've never done it before. I've never done any football TV presenting before. So why do I think I could be good enough for it? You know? But the, um, the Olympic Games also gave me the confidence because it is, it is one of those things where you can turn around and go, oh, I did the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Olympic Games. You know, I, I've been live in front of four billion people. Yeah. So you haven't completely fucked that up. Then you <laughs> kind of have an element of confidence. So, you know, as soon as you finish that gig and you realize you didn't make the biggest mistakes of your life and you realize, actually, I'm kind of okay at this. It gives you a lot more confidence to start tapping on the doors of bigger industries that I maybe wouldn't have done before. Not everyone gets that one job and that's a lot of luck and timing. You know, it's, it's not, no, no, none of my work that brought the Olympics at that time. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that sort of stuff just happens around you and, and luck is a big part of the industry, but luck has to be combined with hard work and talent and everything else around it. So I got lucky with the 2012 Olympic games, but also I tied up everything just right before and did everything just right after to make the absolute most of that opportunity. Yeah, that's the thing. And I feel like it, with big opportunities like that, they only count if you convert them into something afterwards because you could have gone and done that and then just kind of, I don't know, sat back in the success of it all and not not worked hard after. But, you know, you took the opportunity and you ran with it. So, um, Oh, I milked it. You're yeah, so but right. that's so amazing. Uh, and it's obviously made made all the difference now. And <laughs> that's so funny as you're saying. I'm no. still milking it now. I'm sitting here talking <laughs> to you about it now. I'm still milking it now. Do you but know it's, what I mean? You it's such a it. huge... Yeah, but it's such a huge achievement. And as you said, you know, once you've done the Olympics, I, I think you can pretty much do anything after that in terms of uh, confidence and nerves and all that kind of thing. It must have been yeah. pretty, pretty nerve wracking. <laughs> it was it's absolutely terrifying. I tell you the moment that scared me the most is we had, um, so we had like three months of rehearsals beforehand. And oh gosh, I've got to be careful what I say because you signed so many non-disclosures on security. But <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a big red metal box with a microphone in. And they brought it, we had this sort of beautiful glass booth right at the top of the stadium. So we could look down and all our, um, all our narration was triggered by the movements. And I'm, I'm sure you remember the opening ceremony when they had all these beautiful dancers and Voldemort yeah. as a massive puppet and all these incredible things. And, and so our, our, we had direction in our ears the entire time, but everything was triggered, you know, everything was truly live, nothing was pre-recorded and we, we were triggered by all these movements. Um, and then, and the first, I think it was in the first month of rehearsals, there was this big metal red box in the corner with microphone all in and padded, and it had like a handle, like a mini suitcase. And I remember asking what that was, and they said, oh, don't worry, we're not going to tell you about that yet. We'll tell you about it on the night. And then I was like, wait. And then I kept asking, I was like, why? I don't understand why there's a whole microphone set up in this case, and it's it's got a big battery pack, and it sort of runs itself, it looked really cool. And I was like, I don't understand why that's there. And they were like, don't touch it. And they were really cagey about it, and that made me even more curious about it. And then on the night, honestly, about two hours before we go live, and I can tell you we were nervous as hell anyway, they yeah. turned around and sat us down and said, right, if there are any major security issues and we need to evacuate people, move people, you know, this is also 2012 was a time that we were um, not in the simplest of times when it comes to terrorism and, and yeah. it was all a little bit up in the air. Um, and they said, this is our emergency pack. You are going to need to continue your instructions. You are going to be the ones who tell people where to go, where to stay, where safe, where not. You know, you're in control of the audio for the 80,000 piece of stadium and the whole of Stratford at that time. Oh, so we're going to give you instruction, but that's what you're going to do. And that's what that box is for. So you can continue to tell people like, don't panic. And there's, there was a whole set sort of script of lines. Um, don't panic. Please stay here. Don't run. You know, all that sort of stuff. 
And I looked at that, and I was like, oh my God, no way can you put this in the You cannot do that. That is not what I'm trained for. I'm practicing how to say, please stand for the national anthem in French right now. And you're telling me <laughs> that I have to be ready to like lead people through a fire and through like, oh my God. So like being told that was the most nerve wracking thing. Um, yeah, so there's all these sort of little elements from behind the scenes. And even my favorite moments, a lot of people ask me about like, what was your best moment? And that was well before the actual Olympic Games, we were, we were practicing and rehearsing. And because the press really wanted to know about the opening ceremony and, and sell all the secrets, we'd actually rehearse really early in the morning, sometimes at like one, two o'clock in the morning. Oh, really? And I was, yeah, I was walking down to the stadium. It was dark and there's all these little security and you have to show your pass, you have to get searched and over there. And I could hear the music playing from the stadium. And I just was thinking to myself, this music sounds different. And I couldn't quite work out why. And as I got closer, I was like, oh, it's live. It's live. That's why it's not a recording. That's live. Someone's playing live. And then I start to recognize, hey, dude. Da, 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 da. And I was like, oh. holy crap. Paul McCartney is in the stadium <laughs> right now rehearsing. I start running. And I get into the stadium, run into the center of where, you know, the pitch would be. I turn around and literally there's probably four people plodding around with like cones and high vid vests while Paul McCartney is rehearsing. Hey Jude, look with his little group of maybe five people to an empty stadium. And I'm stood there listening to this like it's a solo show for me. Yeah, <laughs> like wow. proper goosebumps. A moment like that, it's, that's priceless. That's crazy. Like... That's one of my favorite memories of all time. And I don't think anything's going to beat that. And that was essentially rehearsals for the day. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's insane. I think, oh, and it, I suppose it's, it's experiences like that and everything that just make all of the hard work, all of, because I'm sure there has been some really challenging times in your whole journey with, mm. with the industry that just make it so worth it when you're standing there alone with Paul McCartney in the middle of a huge stadium. I mean, yeah. that's pretty cool. Exactly. <laughs> So I suppose um, the other aspect of what you do, which I think is really inspirational, is, uh, you know, the path that you've carved for women in the areas that you work. As you mentioned, you know, you're working predominantly in football and MMA, which are notorious for just being male-dominated sports. So I'd be so curious to, to hear what that experience was like, uh, I suppose, in the early days and how it's evolved to now and, and how you've kind of, adapted and navigated the challenges that come with that? Wow, that's a big question. And it's, <laughs> it's a complicated onion of an answer with so many layers. Um, it's hard, it is really, really hard, but it's also the most joyful thing. And I think nothing in life comes easy that's so joyful, right? Like, yeah. um, I, I love both industries very much. I'm very grateful for them and I don't wanna speak ill of them, but we are in a time that's still massively sexist. And these are two industries that are highly testosterone fueled. These are two industries that are quite behind when it comes to the times. And these are two industries that are almost 100% male led from the CEOs to the coaches to the everything, you know, and, and not necessarily by any fault of their own. Us, us women do need to carry some strength and responsibility in wanting to create change. I don't think it's right to just look on men to change everything. We, we can empower that ourselves. But um, it is, you know, a massively male dominated industry everywhere I travel. Um, I remember just last year, the first time I did a trip and there was another woman on it and she was a runner. And I was so excited because I travel the world with a crew of 30 men. You know, I, I go to hotels to do a show with a crew of 40 men. And, um, you know, I very rarely see a female camera woman and never until, yeah, until yesterday, actually, because yesterday I had a pitch to a lovely woman at a brand. But until yesterday, in the sort of 10 years that I've been working in this, I have never ever had a female boss. Every wow. single person and client that I've worked for has been male. Um, and actually I remember the first deeply uncomfortable feeling I had was a shoot for FHM magazine, which is now defunct, but at the time FHM was a really big magazine and it was just post the 2012 Olympic Games. And FHM wanted to do a six page spread and interview on me about how like the girl behind the voice. And they were like, you know, she's a hot girl behind the voice. She's not just a voice for radio. Let's get you out there. Let's get you in a bikini. Let's get you in these beautiful Brazilian colors. And let's do a sexy Layla photo shoot, um, FHM magazine. And I was 
deeply against it. I was like, no way, not in a million years. This is not what I like, not what I do. It's very strange because despite my, uh, my brand, my Instagram and my demeanor, I'm, I'm kind of very private. Like a lot of people don't know anything about my private life. Um, equally, I'm Brazilian. You know, I, I love my body. I'm happy about it. Like I'm not shy physically, but an FHM magazine was just not remotely in my line of what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. Um, so I felt deeply uncomfortable about it. I said no to my agent about 10 times. And then he sat me down one day and he said, listen, you want to do football and you want to, that's, that's, I've told him, right? I want to do football. That's the direction I want to go and get me football gigs. And he said, every single major director and producer in football is what? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, tell me, answer the question. Every single director and producer in the football world who I'm pitching to now is what? And I was like, a man? And he's like, yeah, if you are an FHM magazine, I guarantee they will see it. And if they see it, it makes my job getting you in the football world a lot easier. And however much I hate that fact, <laughs> it's true. And the worst thing that proved it for me is the fact that it was, it made a massive difference. You know, we phoned all these producers and all these directors. We sent my show reel, we sent them clips, we sent them what I've done, told them about uh, the Olympic games, which is a big thing on someone's show reel. You know, I, 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 we did everything to get there. And, and although some were sort of fighting, but nothing happened, it was a big change again when I was in FHM magazine. And then they call and be like, oh, wait, the girl who's in the FHM and did it, oh, her and did it. And it just changed things a lot. So I did it. I did FHM. And the sad thing is it made a massive difference because they are all men. And it is, it's, a, it's like a massive six page advert for me, right? Um, so that was the most uncomfortable thing, not only doing it, but seeing that it made that bigger difference. And me having to accept that there is a massive element and there still is of how you look and how you portray yourself. And, you know, like I never talk about my boyfriends on my Instagram. My Instagram is like 98% male demographic. And I'm very aware if I talk about a guy I'm dating, my, my sort of stats go down real quick. And if my followers go down, I think I posted about a guy once and I lost a thousand followers on the one post. And I was like, if, if that goes down, it directly affects my goals. It directly affects my money. It directly affects my business. It's really strange to try and get that right in your mind. And I try my best to think about it like a, like a shop, like a coffee shop, right? I sell a cinnamon tea and a, and a flat white coffee. And every time I put the cinnamon tea out, everyone just walks away. They hate it. They want the flat white coffee. I need to cater to my demographic whilst at the same time being true to myself. So it's a really hard balance, especially in these two industries. And I've had a million moments where sexism is blatant and sexism is rife. And just the other day, someone phoned me about an MMA job and they said to me, do you, do you actually like MMA? And I've had that question a lot. Do you actually like football? And I'm like, oh no, you know, I've just worked in it for the last 10 years, done yeah. nothing but talk about it for the last 10 years, hang around with it, you know, yeah, no, I'm protect like what? Like how, how can you, and would they, would they ask my male counterpart that question? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Has anyone ever dared to ask Dan Hardy if he actually likes MMA? Obviously not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's, yeah, it's rife, it's constant, but that's, it makes me even more keen to, to push through it and fight it because it is changing. It is changing and people are seeing it more and more and, and women are being given more and more opportunities and, and men are being more and more um, willing and understanding and learning. And, you know, these are men who are brought up by their fathers and most of our sort of any kind of discriminatory issues tend to come down and be fed and taught to us. No one's born racist. No one's born sexist. No one's born with these emotions that are fed down to us. And so, we, we kind of almost I've lost um I've lost any anger in blaming people and now just really really want to just keep going and pushing and showing and teaching in that direction if that makes sense yeah it does and that's that's even though I already knew you know that you would have had to have dealt with some really difficult times and things like that um and had to work so much harder to prove you know your your talent in the area and your interests I, I still think that it's pretty shocking to just hear you speak about that it's still you know mm. such an issue it's kind of one of those things where you know it is but 
until you actually hear it firsthand. Um, well, there's also there's also some strange little things that people don't think about, um, and it's worth me telling you now. So, like my podcast, I run I do a podcast called Voice Notes, which is mm-hmm. all about um, it's like a reaction podcast for UFC, and we have um, different fighters as guests on it. Now, I approach the guests myself, and I say, "Hey, do you want to be on the podcast? Here's the link." And um, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter are brilliant for us to be able to contact. Um, amazing big talents you know direct nowadays you know you don't, there are no agents that much in MMA and there's not these sort of email addresses on their um, website so you know it's a brilliant way to contact people are, are sliding into DMs you know so I, yeah. I will DM a fighter <laughs> and I will say hey I would really love to talk to you about this project we would love to collaborate with you we have um, you know we pay our guests this is the link I think you'd be great on it can we, can we have a conversation? Here's my email address, you know? So a very professional DM I will send. And I've been doing that for a while. We get the best guests on and it works. It's brilliant, you know? Um, however, sometimes I will get some responses that are like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll come on it if you come to dinner with me. Or yeah, I'll come oh, to your pod if you come to this. And I realize I'm like, oh shit, okay. Like, if you think I'm single, you can't blame a dude for trying, but equally, I'm working, I'm sending a professional message and I am now put in a position where I am not having the guests that my podcast like competitors might be having simply because I'm a woman, you know, like when, yeah. you know, another UFC podcast that's led by men asks you to go on, are they put in this situation? Do they have to judge whether or not it's worth it and how you can word a polite reply that says no, but doesn't piss you off because you still want that person on your podcast? You know, do you have to go through all that thinking? No. So, you know, my podcast is held back because there are loads of guests that I can't have because I'm going, I'm turning around and saying, no, I'm not going to dinner with you. No, I'm not doing this favor for you. Yeah. And because I'm saying that I'm losing guests, good guests. And yeah. that's a problem men don't have. So my podcast is held back simply because of that, which is, you know, essentially a sexist trait that holds women back even more. I'm lucky in that I'm in a position where I can say, no, I'm like, no, mate, not in a million years. You know, I'm quite yeah. confident. I'm quite happy. I'm quite secure. I'm like, no. But, you know, new younger girls coming into the industry and seeing like such a big personality, a big celebrity, a big footballer or someone and seeing like, oh shit, like I could go to dinner with them. And also keep in mind, we're fans, right? We're fans. Yeah, that's so like, we'd love to go to dinner with this guy. I think he's amazing, but not like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, it's a real battle. And I'm lucky that I'm now in a place where I can be outright like, no, forget it, next, like whatever. I see, I see the sexism that's in it. But a young girl who's like, oh my God, he's asking for dinner. This is so exciting. And he'll come on my pod if we meet up and, you know, can get caught up in a real fucking messy situation. Yeah. Things just escalate really fast. Um, but yeah, yeah that, that's so interesting to hear your take on that and like the insight into it because I feel like people people are very quick to glamorize, say, jobs um, mm-hmm. in your industry and, and watching what you're doing. But there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that people don't know about. Um, so yeah, thank you for shedding some light on those situations. Um, I'm sure people won't oh, expect wow. that. Um, and so I just have one more question for you and I'm going to let you get on with your Saturday. Um, if I put your 10 year old self in front of you now, having been through everything you've been through, all of the highs and lows in your career and in life in general, what's the biggest piece of advice you'd give that 10 year old self moving forward? You're good. Every single question you've asked me is like a punch. (laughs) (laughs) I get strong. Like I need to think, what would I tell my 10 year old self? You know, I think, a lot of presenters come to me and ask me for advice and I kind of say the same thing and I say it because I truly believe it and I think I wish I, I knew that when I was younger but um, it took me a long time to get to a place where I could be audacious and be truly confident and truly believe in what I'm doing and I think I would tell my 10 year old self like you're right, you're, you're, you're where you should be, you're on the right path be audacious, be brave, be courageous. Um, because I think too often we kind of go, oh, you know, we hold back or we, self, um, we self-sabotage or we, or we tell ourselves we're not ready for something and we're not, you know, we hold back a lot. Um, and I think being audacious and, and 
you know, truly telling people like, I am the best person for this job. I do that now. I got a job recently, unfortunately, I can't talk about it yet, but I got a job recently, which is ridiculous. It's a brilliant gig. And what I did was I messaged the producer and said, by the way, no one's asked me to audition this. You know that, for, you know, that's a mistake, right? And said, you know that that's a big error if you don't get me to audition for this job because I am pretty much perfect for it. And that was an absolutely audacious message that I sent them. But A, I was right. Like I, I knew that in this industry and in that space, I was the best person for the job. And B, I got the job. So it works, you know, yeah, and there is no that. one in the world who can sell you better than yourself. So be audacious, be brave. Um, that would be the advice I give myself then. And I, and I still try to repeat it to myself now and make sure I continue it now. I love that. And I really appreciate you giving your time. Um, as I said before, I know you're super busy and there's so much going on for you. So um, yeah, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, please rate, share and leave a comment if you like what you hear. And don't forget to follow at what it's like pod on Instagram and Facebook. To find out more about Layla and her work today, visit the links provided in the show notes. I'll be back on Thursday with more inspiring stories, but for now, this has been What It's Like with Luce.